An Ideal Retreat by Michael Griffin, the third book, Past Vanishes Before Future Comes Into View. <clears throat> 16. Wake, Interruption of Daylight, An Ebb and Flow of Sickness. Sunlight penetrated curtains. Noon's eyes opened, and she tried to speak Ian's name, but her tongue stuck in her mouth. The door was shut, the room far too hot. That explained what was wrong here. Why hadn't she opened a door? Her mouth was so dry, her head throbbing, like fever sickness, a pain more immediate than she had ever felt. Last night was a blur, memory an eradicated smear. Nothing had happened. All she possessed from that time was this strange, transformed place in which she now lay, sweaty and trembling, a universe sickened, stained antique yellow and dead orange, alone, without a clock. Nothing connected her with the outside world. Her stomach burned. Hadn't she gone downstairs for sparkling water trying to ease an acid stomach? She thought she remembered wanting to get up for a drink. Had something gone wrong on her way down? That must have been part of a dream. <clears throat> she definitely remembered waking up, feeling afraid, then telling herself to go back to sleep, and in the morning everything would be fine. But it wasn't fine. Maybe it was worse than ever. If she had gotten water, at least she wouldn't feel like this. Why was it always so hard to remember what she ought to do in order to avoid this awfulness the next morning? It always seemed perfectly clear later on, but in the moment when she needed to make right choices, options always seemed confusing, almost impossible to narrow down. Life used to be so much easier. When had every decision become so hard? She threw off damp sheets, tried to stand. Her panties were pulled down around one ankle. Pain spiked her forehead. Ian, she remembered, he'd been here. She looked around for proof, but saw no trace. Where had he gone? No, that must have been another part of her dreams. Vaguely, she recalled sex, but that seemed least likely of all. That was something she definitely remember. It had been way too long. This realization made her feel pathetic. An adult woman married, yet so painfully neglected, so detached and physically isolated from every living person, that her last resort had become the confused adolescent's thigh-clenching dreams of ravishment. Yes, she was alone. Everything else could wait. She had to get something for this headache. Water, some kind of pills. Noon wobbled from the room, across the landing to the top of the stairs. As her hand clutched the rail, an image shot to mind, a kind of dark flash, running up and down stairs, tiptoeing through broken glass, smeared footprints. Yes, that last was real. This much she knew to be true. Last night, she had discovered tracks in the hallway. Some events seemed real and definite, while others shifted into uncertainty, taunting psychological echoes from that weird movie. On the lower stairs, a puddle of wine had dried dark, blood black. In the hallway below, glass shards were scattered everywhere, encircling a cluster of dark, shuffling footprints outside the door. Noon approached, still barefoot, cautious, and reached to pick up a triangle of broken glass. As her hand extended, she noticed a scabbed wound on her palm. Pain returned the moment she saw the puncture. Then she remembered falling being tripped. Ian? She tried to project her voice to fill the entire house. Weren't you here? No answer. She could always phone, a casual just checking in to make sure she didn't have to admit her uncertainty as to whether he'd visited in the middle of the night unannounced and left again, but how would she ask? Honey, did you maybe just drive four hours in the middle of the night to fuck me while I was sleeping? Then immediately drive home? It's okay if you did, I just... No, she wasn't making that call. In the fridge, she found the cold Pellegrino she'd craved last night. The bottle still unopened, troubling hands twisted off the cap. Bubbles immediately relieved the acid burn in the pit of her stomach. What time was it? 
The microwave blinked 8888. The LCD display on the range said the same. Noon didn't know why she couldn't seem to remember that none of the clocks here worked. At least they'd never been set. Either she needed to keep her phone charged, or check the time once, then set these clocks. After that, she'd have some reliable, steady frame of reference. She finished the water as she staggered upstairs and grabbed her keys. Even if she didn't want to call Ian now, even if if she ever did want to call, she needed to charge her phone in the car. Why hadn't she brought a wall charger? Maybe she'd been too preoccupied selecting CDs for the noon's greatest hits, jukebox. She opened the, do the front door, stepped out, and faced the brightness of the day. Fear pulsed, an electric twinge. She felt exposed, dangerously susceptible. To what, exactly? Noon tried to hurry down the walk, stepped gingerly across the gravel parking area, and unlocked the car. The console clock read 123. Had she really slept that late? She couldn't remember the last time she'd slept past ten, let alone into afternoon. Jesus, her head ached. Her eyes seemed incapable of adjusting to this stabbing sun. The light penetrated to sensitive hollows within her brain. Behind her eyes and below her ears, acid-filled vacancies where her mind ought to reside, but which had been overrun, breeding grounds for throbbing disease or merely the chemical breakdown of a mind completely... Fuck, she's so hungry. That was all. She climbed out of the car, slammed the door, and staggered up the walkway. Even the view out front didn't impress her much right now. It seemed like a different life, that first moment she'd seen this place. At a time like now, who cared about architecture or design? She needed breakfast. Medicine. In the kitchen, she quickly discarded any pressure to create a complicated breakfast, and simply slow-fried two eggs in yellow-green olive oil, the idea had sounded good, but the smell made her sick, and she had to turn away. She decided to grind some coffee while the eggs finished cooking. On the back counter, to the left of the sink, was a commercial-grade espresso machine. This she could handle. While two shots drizzled into a squat barum double-walled glass, she turned off the stove and slid her eggs onto a plate, trying not to break the yolks. Caffeine shot straight up her spine and into her brain. Her headache lessened, but not the nausea. Faced with the eggs, her stomach refused. She set them aside, hoping they might seem tolerable in a little while. Of course she needed to eat. Many times she'd gotten into bad trouble, forgetting to feed herself while she chased other sustenance. Her ankle throbbed hard. Now that constricted blood vessels in her battered and swollen brain had begun to dilate with caffeine, the stabbing pain in the joint rose to the surface of awareness. She must have fallen, rolled the ankle on the stairs. She needed a pill, but couldn't remember where she'd left her purse. She seemed to vaguely remember seeing pill bottles in one of the kitchen cabinets. The first door she checked brightened her state of mind, revealing the stash Joda had left behind. Vicodin, Percocet, Oxy, even more Xanax. Two perks made the prospect of a shower vastly more tolerable. After chasing down the pills before the drugs could even begin to have an effect, Noon went out to the hallway and cleaned up the broken glass. Then she limped back to the kitchen, washed her hands, and made a sandwich. Two eggs sunny side up on sourdough with her favorite artisanal mayonnaise. The stuff in the jar wrapped with blue twine, plus Irish cheddar and a blanket of pink Himalayan sea salt. Everything was already getting better again. She could tell things had begun changing because she was able to imagine pleasures again, at least small ones. Noon put her plate in the sink, ran hot water over it, and breathed. She was going to get through this. The terrifying black cloud had begun to drift off and thinned enough to allow the passage of a little sunlight. What she needed next was a shower. Seventeen. Landing. A room from memory. Objects from pictures. At the top of the stairs, something caught Noon's eye, like the flitting of a butterfly at the edge of peripheral vision. But nothing had moved. At first, she wasn't sure what had changed, and just stood staring, doubting her perceptions. 
Then she saw it, right in front of her, a new doorway. Straight ahead, directly in the middle of the light gray wall, where before no door had existed. Her blood chilled. Goosebumps tingled up her arm to her shoulders. This wasn't right. It didn't fit. She had always categorized this flat, unadorned wall as one of the house's few architectural shortcomings. Why not at least a window to overlook the view outside? But this wasn't an exterior wall, it turned out. At least not anymore. Nun hated herself for doubting both what she saw now and what she remembered having seen before. This wasn't similar to the locked door at the bottom of the stairs with its cracking paint and wobbling antique knob so badly out of sync with the design of the rest of the house. This upstairs door was different because it was slightly open. Beyond the narrow gap was another space, a sunlit room she'd never seen. Her assumptions about the shape of all the rooms, the placement of every door, wall, and window around her now seemed questionable. Hadn't it seemed the least bit strange before? A house nearly 4,000 square feet, but with only two bedrooms? True, both upstairs rooms were enormous. In fact, the entire place seemed to have been designed with a respect for open spaces, broad hallways, and high ceilings, rather than a larger number of enclosed rooms. That was part of what she'd liked about it from the first. Besides, she'd always assumed the place was a remodel with... No, she'd never assumed that. She had to remember to start being honest with herself, always, no matter what. A beautiful show home like this had never been a falling down shack, or whatever term Ian had used. A whole new space, not a dozen steps in front of her, a sunlit room never before seen by anyone. Noon hesitated, trembling with fright and also perverse excitement. She wanted to back away, close her eyes, and descend the stairs. She wanted to avoid thinking about this. But also, she needed to see what was here, inside. Not only desired to know, needed. Three steps closer. She paused, then moved again. Close enough to reach out, push the door open a little more. The room was still under construction. A smell of raw wood and drying interior latex paint. The narrow section of wall visible from outside appeared half-finished. Bare studs to the left, then taped, unfinished sheetrock, then to the right, textured and painted walls, ready to show. Closer. Almost near enough to poke her head inside. The floor ranged from open beams to rough plywood, and to the extreme right, was finished in the same glossy bamboo flooring as the rest of the upstairs. New construction overnight? No, she would have heard, and anyway, nobody built this way, an entire room gradually fading into solidity like an inexplicable dream. Real construction was a sequence of discrete processes, each stage finished before the next was undertaken. Not like this, a kind of magic that drifted, cloud-like, bringing a vague, unfinished conception from the left into complete, finished reality to the right. Noon backed up slowly until she felt the drop-off behind her, the stairs too close, then turned and fled into the master bedroom. Who was she fucking kidding? She had to get out of here now. She flung her suitcase onto the bed and frantically threw in every loose item in a wide-eyed, heart-thudding rush. This manic surge peaked and began to trail off. What else? Nothing was left back home. She was still afraid. That hadn't changed, but she didn't really want to run. Not home. Not a return to the way things were. Calm, Noonie. Her voice remained low and steady, one corner of her mind trying to talk the rest down from the brink of panic. She just had to make sense of this, that was all. Another day exactly like yesterday, that was all she wanted. Solitary pleasure. A quiet mind. Stability. That feeling of residing within her own boundaries. She pulled aside the curtains, drew up the blinds. Intense sun, just like yesterday afternoon, beside the pool. Brilliant light eradicated the bland yellow sickness that had filled the room since she woke. Just look. Take another look. She moved her face nearer the window and the overpowering sun. She remembered yesterday outside, so bright, this is it. What you wanted. Noon turned back to regard the disorganized mess of her open suitcase. 
This was the way her mind worked, always overreacting, like a skittish cat. Anything that bothered her, any obstacles she encountered, anything unknown, she flung aside everything around her and scattered in mad hyperpanic. No wonder she could never make any kind of progress. She was always too busy picking up broken pieces of the night before, spending time resetting all life's fragments into their proper places, always trying to make up for the last crack-up. She moved the suitcase from the bed back to the top of the dresser and stopped dead. Whatever recognition, recognition she'd achieved, or momentary peace she'd found, any hope for a return to calm vanished as her heart thudded anew. Sweat trickled cold down the side of her head and dripped down her neck. She didn't want to look directly at what she saw, but it was right there in front of her. The bedding was a black-and-white grid pattern accented with a few red Jackson Pollock spatters. Yesterday the bedding had been different. She remembered it, clearly dark gray with light gray circles, but the problem wasn't just that it had changed or that the stain of red wine spilled in the night was no longer visible. What was so much worse, more upsetting, was a particularity of this new design. She dug through the suitcase, beneath the tangle of clothes, looking for the new Dwell magazine she'd been reading two days ago. Madly, she flipped through pages, frantic in her search for a specific photo spread. Here, this pictorial had stuck in her mind some artist's home in Barcelona. All white stained structural concrete, glass brick and square aluminum tubing, and the artist's bed identical to this one. Now that she looked more carefully around the room, she saw it wasn't just the bed covers, the headboard too was different, exactly like the one in this magazine. And in another photograph, the shower was a slate tile enclosure and a rain shadow spray head. Things were changing. She might have sensed it before, but had believed the problem resided not out in the world external to herself, but derived from some glitch of mind or failure in the mechanism of memory. Easier to believe it was only pills, or too much drinking, or that she had simply been taught by desperation and loneliness to imagine the world around her different from how it was objectively. But this magazine, the specific details of this pattern, solid things couldn't just transform, remake themselves to conform to daydreams or wishes or photographs of ideal lives in magazines. Something was shifting, something true, and maybe not only within her, something inside wanted out. Eighteen. Inventory. A catalog of measurements and a drawn key. Not yet ready to venture out, Noon retreated to a safe place. The stone-tiled shower, though it stood completely opened on the side nearest the soaking tub, had the feel of an enclosed compartment. When she stood beneath the hot drizzle, steam rising around her, she felt embraced within a warm haven, an anechoic chamber safe for dangerous thoughts. The water burned, sensitized her skin. She liked it. Everything seemed clarified, the future becoming ever more possible. She could not decide which possibility seemed more agreeable to her, apart from the less relevant question of what might be actually true. Could solid objects transform themselve, themselves while she wasn't looking, or were her memory and perception utterly failing? Her mind tended to reject any explanation reliant upon the impossible, however preferable, she couldn't dismiss the chance that slippage occurred within a subjective system. If she needed to know what was truly happening, she had to rule out distortions of sense and mind. She formulated an intention to sketch floor plans and take a detailed inventory of every room in the house. No more wondering whether a bed covering had actually changed. No more wasting time wondering whether a new room had appeared overnight or if she'd failed to notice a new door. Time to rule out uncertainty. One way to improve her situation right away, she decided, was to stop averting her eyes every time she encountered something that frightened her. Time to stop running away, and start confronting reality as it truly existed, no matter how uncomfortable. 
Nobody enjoyed fear, but far better to face individual fears head on, try to deal with them without evasion. That reflexive avoidance had gotten her into this tangle, the mess her life had become. She wasn't going to start blaming her marriage to Ian, but she should at least own up to the reality that both of them had begun ignoring major problems over the years. The arrangement no longer worked for her at all, yet instead of confronting the issues, she'd picked avoidance and denial. This only made the fear and tension extend forever and gradually multiply. A lifetime worth of problems, trailing behind, like cans tied to a string. Now she would fix this. To start, she needed something to write and sketch with. She shut off the shower, toweled off, and dressed. On her way down to the desk for pen and paper, Noon reflexively averted her eyes, but this time she caught herself. She forced herself to look at what she feared. When she stopped, she didn't just turn her head to see, but stood straight and open, facing the door. She glared at it like an enemy. After a moment, the fearful expectation faded. The door wasn't anything to worry about. In the desk, she found an ultra-fine black sharpie and a yellow pad. On the pad's top sheet, a shape remained visible from what had been drawn on the page before, since torn away. The outline was clear, an old-fashioned key. It resembled none of the keys Ian had given her, which were all modern. An old key like this was the kind that she expected would fit this antique knob, but why a drawing of a key and not the key itself? Noon reached for her purse, looking for her phone, planning to call Ian, but the purse remained upstairs, and her phone was still charging out in the car. Anyway, why would she call Ian? He'd only ask about the usual. Lately, Ian had become exclusively interested in the twin subjects pills and wine. She wished Ian might somehow become able to accept her again, and not only judge, like last night when he... She caught herself. He was never here. She recalled Ian's smell and the way he touched her. She missed how it had felt to be with him, or at least be with someone. Her hands trembled, and she wasn't sure why. Noon went into the kitchen and headed for the cupboard full of Joda's leftover medication. Careful there, Noonie, she warned in a deep voice and tended to sound like Ian. This was all she needed. Two more of the little ovals and a gulp of water. Swallowed, forgotten. A clean slate. There in the kitchen, she began her all-encompassing inventory. Her project required nothing more than the sharpie and legal pad. She was able to measure distances by pacing barefoot, heel to toe. Every object, every room. She sketched, wrote detailed lists. Downstairs alone took over three hours. She took a break to eat something, proud of herself for what she'd accomplished, and for remembering to eat before falling into confused desperation. She felt no temptation to open any wine before she was finished. One thing she was learning was that every place was the same, fundamentally. Just doors and walls, floors and ceilings, sometimes a window. Every interior space in the world was assembled from these same parts. One room, one house, was no different in kind from the rest, really, just differently arranged. By the time she began upstairs, the fears that had driven her downstairs had drifted far away, like the clouds of another day's storm. Everything felt weightless, even the new upstairs room, which she realized now she might have actually noticed upon arrival but only forgotten, had become merely another set of details to document and measure. One indulgence she denied herself, at least for now, was to waste energy trying to decide whether the room had become still more complete, more nearly final and solidified, in the hours since its discovery. When she had finished with the entire house, every page in the writing pad was filled. The house, its contents, and the number of sheets of paper available had been a perfect match. Sometime before, without her noticing the sky outside had gone dark, Noon felt proud of her accomplishment, but her psyche had also begun to fray around the edges. The problem was more than just worry about the details of the house. Her accustomed balance of pills and wine had shifted, probably too much. A little wine would help. She went down, poured a familiar peanut noir. 
Last night had been such a nightmare, a nasty disappointment after such a beautiful, revelatory day, in and out of sleep, black shapes floating in the darkness and falling every time she took the stairs. Now it was time to leave fear and panic behind. She was lucky. Xanax softened everything, especially on top of whatever else it was she'd taken earlier, and wine was a key ingredient in a tolerable life. Her predicament, which had before been a direct and immediately confrontational threat, now sat quiet at a discreet distance. She glared back at it, unblinking, with no more anxiety, just calm regard and perfect willingness to accept scrutiny. Noon barely recalled what anxiety was even supposed to feel like. Already it seemed foolish, all her earlier worry, and that jittering nervousness, dormant now. The whole story of her life, all her bound-together worries, how could that be of interest to anyone? She stood in the hallway downstairs, looking at the desk, the floor, the doorway, and wondered how she had ever felt afraid. This sensation was like reading someone else's case study. Facts on the page conveyed no emotion. This was the relief the pills were capable of granting her. Speaking of pills, enough time had passed. She slipped into the kitchen, opened the Xanax bottle, and took out two more ovals. She chased these down with the slug of peanut noir from the bottle. She laughed. Her back and shoulders had begun to ache, more with fatigue than tension. But not for long. Nineteen. Spa. Night on sunbathing. Cold darkness with closed eyes. Waiting for the pills to kick in, Noon wasn't quite sure what to do with herself. Warmth was something she still craved. She could take another shower, or maybe go outside, try the hot tub. Really, the idea that was st st stuck in her mind was this desire to revisit the way she'd felt yesterday afternoon. She'd set aside her fears, dared to unclothe herself and venture out. Not that she needed to swim and sunbathe naked again. Anyway, now that the sun had set, yesterday's plan couldn't be repeated, at least not until tomorrow. Why couldn't she go outside? Tonight, in the dark, she'd have more privacy than under yesterday's direct hot sunlight. It was probably cold now, but somehow that didn't matter. She couldn't stop thinking about it. Lying there, feeling her body transform, anxieties diminish. None of that had anything to do with the sun. The point was that she had forced herself to relax, to remain still, eyes closed. Though she hadn't forgotten the central problem with this idea, the inevitable cooling with the fall of darkness, Noon went upstairs for a bath towel. She returned downstairs, still dressed, carrying the towel, determined, though unsure, what would happen outside, from the kitchen out the back of the house. The patio surrounding the pool was not entirely dark. The three planters glowed green. Last night, the colors had been different, at least that was how she remembered it, but outside hadn't been part of her inventory, so she wasn't sure. Also, <clears throat> there was another feature she hadn't noticed before, accentuated by the sidelong shadow cast by the green lights, a triangular cantilever step, or a low bench which jutted from the concrete retaining wall halfway between pool and spa, about six inches off the ground. <clears throat> Instead of seeking the chase at the corner of the pool nearest the house, Noon continued past the pool toward the spa. She spread her towel on the last of the lounges and almost removed her clothes, but hesitated. The night was far too cold outside, even colder than she would have guessed. She knelt beside the spa, intending to check the water temperature, but the cover was fastened so firmly she couldn't even lift the edge. No lock was visible let alone any means to open it. Strange that the pool cover opened and closed automatically with the press of a plainly visible button, but the hot tub remained off-limits, secured by some secret. Still, she knew what she wanted. The concept remained fixed in her mind, impossible to dismiss. Hurriedly, she undressed. Her skin constricted at the touch of cold. She lay on the towel and, clo and closed her eyes. This wasn't going to work. 
She wrapped arms around herself, turned on her side, and drew knees up in a fetal position. Just think of warmth, she thought. Remember the way it felt. The shivering began as a reflex. Noon told herself to ignore it. All she needed was to convince her body to relax, eyes closed. The human mind could find a way past anything. Lie here. Imagine the sun. The only impressions made upon closed eyes were abstract patterns in the darkness. Maybe this was feedback from inside her eyelids or an attempt by her mind to make sense of null inputs, eyes closed in the dark. Why not open them? Noon pressed her knuckles into her eyes, and ours flashed green and purple, shot through with white pinpoints. The movie last night, like nothing she'd ever seen. Noon had no idea of the title and hadn't really comprehended a single word spoken, at least in any way she could explain verbally. Was it possible inexplicable images and sounds glimpsed in the dreamy haze of night might have the power to redirect her life? Noon imagined how it must feel to die. Would she become afraid as inevitability grew nearer and wish she might rush backward in time, change her mind, reverse decisions lost past? It would be easier to face, with the right pills and enough wine. That combination made everything seem easier. Probably she was already full of more than enough pills. She could make the final summit climb and finish things with just one more. She wanted to will her mind into transformation, put into motion a constructive force. When the time came to open her eyes, she wanted to feel stronger, full of certainty, not just a warm, tan body, but an entirely new person inside, the woman she'd always meant to become. Someone who could handle Ian, make things right between them, or decide to do without him. Other women had done it. Imagine the sun. Feel it warm your skin. It's possible. Noon opened her eyes, and her mind returned to a body already shivering uncontrollably. The night was so cold. She stood, grabbed her towel and clothes, and ran back to the house. Twenty. Shower. Unquenchable cold and listening to static. Noon had never really enjoyed liquor. Ian always accused her of only sticking to wine because she believed that dislike for the hard stuff proved her drinking wasn't really problematic. This moment she returned to the house feeling chilled to the core. If she'd found any whiskey at hand, Noon would have gulped down mouthful upon mouthful. Instead, she jogged upstairs, ran the water hot in the shower, and stood under it, eyes closed, remembering how she had felt outside. At first, her teeth chattered and her body shivered with the occasional convulsive twitch. Even when this stopped, her skin felt bitten by cold. Hands and feet were the worst, as if the blood refused to circulate in these parts of her, which ached as if pierced by cold nails, despite the steaming spray. Her extremities belonged to another different person, aspects to some strange, dislocated body. Something had to change. Noon reached down, touched herself between the legs. Xanax usually reduced the need, or at least her sense of desire, until it all became so pent up and tangled she stumbled over it. She felt on the verge of tears, so ridiculously, foolishly overrun with undefined need and wrenched by physical wanting. Two different women, at odds within one body, her hand acted upon herself as, as if possessed by another's intention. This moment, as she gave in to the furious desire to touch and the hungry need to be touched, she felt none of the romantic longing supposed to drive feminine desire, at least for women considered textbook normal. What she felt in its place was more like nausea or despair. This awareness did not make her less determined or frantic. She couldn't stop driven by a kind of inwardly directed anger, a furious urgency toward bodily punishment or harm. She pushed fingers deep inside, not the way she normally touched herself. No, Noon imagined someone else's hands, someone's body, their force and weight. Yes, this. She bit her lip too hard, so hungry, so full of pain and unmet desire. 
Most of the time, she couldn't admit to herself how much she lacked. Now, touching this way, hard and hurtful, using her body the way she wished someone would use it, a stranger, muscles of her thighs rigid, pelvis clenched, one part of herself resisting another. She pushed back, both sides of a struggle, grinding hand against body, body against hand. She threw back her head, took the hot spray full in the face, eyes open, mouth wide, breathing hard, inhaling the spray that threatened to choke her. Yes, this, this, someone else. That burning ember, acid hot seething in her gut, trying to burst, to explode outward. I need, another's voice, speaking nearby, need, finally. The fierce clenching culminated, then lessened. She leaned forward, coughed out what she'd inhaled, still breathing hard, but slowing, returning to normal. Noon turned the hot water down to lukewarm. She began to see again. It was as if her mind had been absent from her body for years. Now, yesterday and today, she was experiencing what it was like to be herself, to reside within her own body and feel awareness of it rather than detachment. Noon hadn't felt guilty or ashamed about masturbating since her early teens, but this was different from usual. Most often it was something done without thinking, quickly and without investing much of herself. She'd never really considered it exactly sexual, and most often managed to fall short of feeling satisfied in the moment itself. A poor substitute, but better than nothing. She toweled off inside the shower enclosure before she stepped out. Yes, this was new, different. She felt giddy, astonished, as if she'd accidentally stumbled upon some important secret, long hidden until now. So much frustration had boiled over, risen in a kind of deranged lust born out of ferocious, hostile need. She hadn't felt that way in so long, she couldn't remember if it was the first time. This aftermath seemed strange, <clears throat> at once triumphant and shameful, as if she'd finally been unfaithful to Ian. Her hands trembled, not only from fatigue. Already she knew this was something she wanted to do again, with somebody else next time, or at least soon. This realization was a massive new presence, a proximate planet around which she now orbited and could not escape. As she pulled on white jeans and a gray t-shirt, Noon heard something outside the room. Maybe she'd been hearing it all along, but had managed not to notice for a while. Yes, it was the stereo, the detuned radio, a howling, windswept landscape of static emitting from speakers on the other end of the upstairs. She followed the sound out of the bedroom, around the landing and along the railed bridge of the catwalk. The sitting area at the end was open, not really hidden from the rest of the house, but just easy to put out of mind. Noon kept forgetting she left this static playing since yesterday. This background noise was issuing from speakers, and wasn't a surreal ambiance inherent to this place. She knelt on the leather ottoman, closed her eyes, and leaned into the left speaker. Yes, she could envision the place. A road swirling with wine, people climbing a mountain slope. What was this place? Enveloped in the wash of static, like the hot water of the shower or the piercing light of the sun on the patio, Noon recalled a dream. Had it been last night, or maybe she'd, or maybe before she'd come here? A dream world of hissing noise, just like this. She'd found a black box, barely concealed, hidden in plain sight. Within the box, a folio of secrets, sketches and diagrams, exact measurements, geometric studies, Descriptions of hypothetical spaces, the key to this house, output of a mind obsessed with relationships between spaces of habitation and their occupants. Noon's hand brushed against something hard, unexpected between ottoman and shelves. She opened her eyes. A black box made of wood. No lock. The lid came off easily. Inside was a folio of papers, as in the very dream recalled just moments ago. Although she had remembered the dream, opening the box, leafing through pages, she retained no recollection of exactly what she'd found inside. Now she could see. So many pages. 
In one, a white-robed figure stood in a flat field, staring across a gap of distance at a large house. The significance of the gap between observer and structure was clarified by a geometrical drawing in that intervening space, a triangle overhead, too high to reach, but significant. The lower corners of the simple equilateral were, were marked B and C, where while the triangle's peak was A, and connected via vertical line to point far overhead. That lofty ideal was marked D. The figure's identity could not be seen because she was facing away toward the building, the object of her desire. The loose white robe covered her body and her head. Only a small gap allowed her to peer out from eyes, which remained hidden. In the next, a bridge of stone blocks arched across a gap over a narrow, dark river. As in the other image, geometric figures were superimposed over vacant space, giving ratios and measurements to tangible objects below. This geometry was more complex, the angles not symmetrical. A larger triangle encompassed a central square, corner points labeled E, F, G, and H. Each of the component parts of the larger triangle that were not the inner square were themselves smaller triangles with their own corners marked. So much truth. The geometry explained everything, proved what Noon believed had always believed. Everything around us, every structure and aspect of decor, including the natural world, was comprised of complex shapes interacting. Geometry was all. Beauty itself was only an appealing balance of ratios. Empty space could be altered and transformed by non-existent objects. When a bedspread changed its pattern, or an arrangement of rooms altered overnight, that wasn't impossibility. That was nothing but how the universe had always been made. Twenty-one. Bedroom. Whispers outside. Possible dark shapes. This line of thinking, Noon realized, was the very thing that had always gotten her into trouble. Such philosophical digressions made her head throb like a concussion, and worse, initiated these never-ending lines of speculation, which she continued chasing even long after recognizing the problem's basic inscrutability, meandering and spinning in mind, until the next thing she knew, the sun would be rising again, and she'd crash, sick and angry, wanting to die. Ian wasn't there to force her to eat or take her pills. At least she usually remembered the pills on her own. She shut the folio of drawings inside the box and hid it away. With the intention of turning off the stereo, she reached for the switch, but decided to leave it playing. The static noise soothed her, like a song. Didn't people listen to white noise machines to help them sleep? That meant the sound conveyed beneficial properties. Downstairs, she ate four mouthfuls of sesame noodle salad, as if taking medicine, then swallowed another pill and poured a fat peanut wire. On her way back upstairs, carrying the glass with special care to avoid spilling, she admired the wine's color and body. She preferred dark wine, saturated ruby red, too opaque to see through, thick as blood. Noon settled onto the bed, feeling loose-limbed and pleasantly foggy. She attributed this state of relaxation to what she'd done in the shower, and smiled with contentment and a kind of joy at her secret. Best fuck you've had in ten years, at least, she whispered playfully, and almost laughed, then stumbled over an unexpectedly jagged twinge of sorrow. Not only was the joke probably literally true, but those ten years didn't remotely cover the full extent of her problem. Times like this, she found herself counterbalancing reality with platitudes. It's a good marriage, she might have said, or... I'm lucky to have a man like Ian. These thoughts always managed to dead-end whatever line of thinking she might have been itching to pursue. Some part of her always wanted to believe their marriage to be a good one, 
though it actually wasn't. Savoring a mouthful of wine, she reached for the remote. The TV clicked on, and the screen resolved as it had the night before, from blue to black, then coarse, busy static. She allowed herself to consider the movie, though she'd been trying to avoid thinking about it. Probably that dark, weird narrative explained her nightmares. She would have slept better if she'd shut it off, even if it had sensed, even if it had seemed interesting enough to grab her attention at the time. Noon raised the remote, thinking maybe she ought to shut the TV off and sleep, rather than getting started with another movie. Her hand wavered, skewed sideways, back and forth, out of control. The remote dropped from her hand, bounced off the bed, and clattered to the hardwood floor. The room spun. She tried to reach down for the remote, and almost fell off the bed. Whoa, shit, Mooney. Two-handed, she steadied the wine glass, then slurped several mouthfuls, trying to lower the level so she'd be less likely to spill. At once, she felt badly out of control, wildly drugged. Hadn't she eaten something? The glass was below half full now, so she slowly maneuvered it toward the side table and placed it there. Lately, everything was flailing and smashing. She'd been fine on her way upstairs and before that in the shower, but she'd lost track of time, listening to the static and looking through the folio of old pictures. Definitely better to sleep now, shut everything down. She didn't want another night of upheaval. The television's monochrome noise brightened. The sizzle reminded Noon of radio static, though the effect upon her mind was contrary. Rather than relaxing, the wildly churning visuals ratcheted up her anxiety. Her surroundings felt threatening, as if danger had rushed up and poised nearby. Her hands twitched, and her heart fluttered, weak as a dying bird. Beyond the bedroom's double doors, something rustled. Even more than fear, Noon felt anger. She was only trying to relax, to self-reflect, and maybe learn to better cope with her problems. Why did everything have to be so difficult? She tried to stand, wobbled, and crashed sidelong across the dresser top. Her shoulder slammed the mirror so hard it cracked, and her head struck the corner of the TV, dazed. She tried to straighten, to regain her feet. In her disorientation, she almost eased back onto the bed, but decided she had to know what was making that sound. She eased towards the doors, still not trusting her balance. One steadying hand slid along the bed's footboard, and she shuffled her feet until she was near enough to almost lunge toward the closed doors. The hinge creaked as Noon eased one of the doors open. Dim light floated up from below, some downstairs lamp left on. Against the dark background of the landing, darker shapes, tar-black outlines of men, drifted up and down the stairs, circulating weightlessly in silent, organized rows. The house moaned as if shifting on its foundation, settling into some newly changed shape. Noon's heart thumped painfully. Was she hallucinating or crazy? She tried to breathe but felt paralyzed, lungs unwilling to expand to intake air. Her entire body resisted movement or action. One of the black outlines veered from its drifting echelon and flitted toward her, hissing an airy sound. <sighs> Not a human voice, not even distant static, but wind howling at the gap of a window not quite shut. Noon didn't want this, but couldn't move. How could she possibly just turn back, try to sleep this away? She couldn't hide. A closed door wasn't adequate protection to allow her to pretend this wasn't happening. Then she remembered a promise she had just made herself to face things, no matter how difficult. Anger at her inward timidity overwhelmed any outward fear. She flung the door fully open. Illumination of TV static filled the landing. Dark shapes broke around the edges. Their edges became vague, less similar to men. Gaps between the forms widened. 
Noon was already less certain what she had seen. It was like watching a cloud shaped exactly like something familiar, transformed beyond recognition as individual clouds shifted in the migrant wind. No individuals remained outside. No traces of threat, just wisps of indefinite shadow. Noon was alone on the empty landing. Her head felt clearer. Her body returned to her control. Already she doubted she'd ever really seen shapes, and wondered at the way imagination acted upon emptiness and darkness, con conjured solid things out of blind fear. This was always her way, doubting what she knew, questioning all she saw or felt. She refused to run. This house was precisely where she belonged, exactly what she wanted, a place of her own. She could learn to manage obstacles, find ways around them. Even this overwhelming fear had lasted only a moment. It had been broken down by nothing more than an accident of light. Of course, in the morning, everything would be better again. Before she shut the door and went to bed, one thing remained. The desk lamp downstairs remained lit. Noon wanted to turn it off, but still didn't quite trust her coordination. Even though she felt better now, what had gone wrong? Too tired, and yes, she admitted probably too much wine, too many pills. The lamp bothered her, an unfinished matter. She could take it to the rail, then hold on, ease her way down. One foot after another, pausing between steps, her vision wasn't entirely clear yet, but she could handle this much if she took it slow. Carefully, she stepped down, gripping the rail. Whenever she started to feel actually afraid, really in trouble, she stepped up to a level of extra care that allowed her to get by. The real problem was the other moments, after caution ended. One more step, and she was there, the bottom of the stairs, the desk, the lamp. Something she saw arrested her reach. On the surface of the otherwise empty desk was a tarnished silver key, exactly the same shape as the outline she'd found on the legal pad. The key certainly hadn't been there before. Noon reached. At the moment her fingertip touched the key, three forceful knocks sounded. She jumped, already fully within the grip of fear again. She spun to face the hallway door. The knocks repeated, not from beside her, but from the front door across the room. Someone had arrived. Twenty-two. Arrival. A knock. A door. A visitor. Without having solidified any intention to move, Noon found herself in motion, skewing diagonally across the living room in the direction of the sound. Her legs weren't exactly under her control, so she veered, and rather than reach the door, she ended up at the rightmost window. She was still near enough to reach the door in a few steps, but paused to look out the window. Nothing revealed itself in the tangible darkness outside, no headlights below, nobody standing on the porch. Noon wanted to say something hoped to trigger some answer which might help clarify the situation. She hesitated, afraid her voice might reveal fear or vulnerability, but she had to speak. Who's there? Me. A man's voice, familiar and impatient. It's just me. Noon sidled away from the window, found the Dora's outer edge reached for the knob and gripped it. He wanted this, she whispered to herself, trying to convince herself anyone could be out there. She turned the knob and pulled the door open. Outside was very dark. 
Ian stood there on the porch, face barely visible. He sidestepped past her into the house. It occurred to noon she hadn't managed a clear enough look to be sure it was him. Already he was inside. It was too late to change her plan. Anyway, who else could it be? This was Ian. He was here. You really give me a jolt. Noon's jackhammer pulse began to slow. She tried to convince herself the fear was behind her now that she knew who had arrived, but her palm was slick on the doorknob as she shut the door. By the time she turned, Ian had already crossed the room to stand before the desk, where Noon had been at the moment of his knock. Ian, what are you doing here? Noon squinted, eyes straining. She started toward him. What are you... His hand shot to the lamp and clicked it off. Noon perceived only blackness, no shapes or movement. Where was he? The only trace of light was a tangent of dim glow from the kitchen. This had to be the uncalibrated LED clocks on the stove and microwave, she guessed, barely reaching around the corner into this room. A shuffle of movement in the hall. Had he stepped closer or away toward the stairs? She held up the old key with fingers so sweat-slick she thought she might drop it. Turn on the light. Look what I found. Let me, he rasped. Suddenly, Ian was much closer, hand extended, palm up. The hand was just an outline, only vaguely connected to a faceless man-shape. It was strange, feeling this direct, immediate threat from Ian. She preferred him this way. At least part of her did. Noon took a few steps, but stopped short of reaching him. She held the key outstretched, still beyond his grasp. He lunged, snatched away the key, then moved to the old door a few steps away. His broad back concealed his hands, which began to work the key in the lock. She didn't need to see. The click and rattle of loose metal created enough clarity. Don't! Noon's voice quavered. Of course she was afraid. Why had she ever tried to believe she wasn't? Leave it locked. Let's go home. This suggestion felt worse than surrender, more like giving up completely, but despite any dejection at failing to take a stand in her marriage, the prospect of a return to safety seemed enticing now. Better to endure the trickle of low-level misery than remain locked in the grasp of panic in the face of this outsized unknown. The lock made a solid click, the key turned, and the door swung open. Old hinges creaked. Fragments of rust cracked loose and fluttered to the floor, making minuscule ticking sounds like grains of sand on wood. His shape slipped past the threshold and stepped down. He disappeared. Ian? Nguyen saw nothing, could find no solid point of external reference. She felt herself spin, as if whirling in a tire swing on a long rope. Her stomach heaved. It would be better to see, even to be faced with something terrible. So much better than imagining. She remembered the desk lamp. Her hand groped beside her and found the switch. The rebirth of that dull orange glow changed her immediate sphere but barely seemed to affect what lay beyond the doorway. Only the topmost descending stairs stood revealed. Worn steps of plain wood faded down into black. Everything Noon could see, she could deal with. Whatever came, she would force herself to face. No more looking away. No more hiding. Ian! Noon's cry extended and trailed into raggedness until her voice cut off, broken by a fit of hyperventilation, gasping in panic. She leaned back against the wall, trying to stay calm, then let herself slide to the floor. Had it been long enough for another pill? She squeezed eyes shut, covered them with unsteady hands. He'll be back, she moaned. Why didn't he at least say something? Let her know he was okay. She tried to hold her breath. Noon, stop. 
She lowered her hands, but didn't open her eyes. Her arms dangled, so her fingertips brushed the floor. The boards felt rough, not the smooth, gleaming hardwoods, she recalled. A memory returned, one of the stories Ian had told about coming here as a kid. The ragged, splintered floorboards always snagged their socks and left slivers in their feet. She breathed. Imagination was her real enemy, especially when she was alone. It only made things worse, constantly wondering what might have just disintegrated or come into existence the very moment she looked away. It was better to see than to wonder. She kept telling herself this, repeated it so many times, but the idea always passed through her, immaterial as a nagging ghost. This time, Noon needed to listen. She had to learn what was below, if she ever wanted to understand this place. This was her home. If anybody should be exploring, she should. Fingertips stroked the floorboards, feeling for the texture. The floor was smoothly polished, even glossy, exactly the way she remembered it looking from the moment she'd arrived, exactly as she wanted it to be. Twenty-three. Downstairs. Unmeasurable unknown and answers to questions. The perfect smoothness of the bamboo floor was reassuring. Nothing had really changed. Noon stood, opened her eyes, and before she allowed herself time to venture again toward apprehension, she turned. The door remained open right beside her, where it had been all along. A half-step took her to the edge of the stairs down. She reached, found the rail, and gripped it. With a last reminder to breathe deep and slow, she ventured that first step. Weak light from the desk lamp behind her already dwindled. Darkness below was a pool of ink. Another step. Her foot probed below, then her weight settled again and again. Down and to the left, around an invisible corner, a tiny light flickered like a wind-blown candle. This small presence encouraged her. A few more steps brought Noon to a landing from which stairs angled left. The next step in this new direction creaked under her weight. She saw him below, huddled near the candle, searching a shelf of books. He seemed to notice her sound, but didn't turn. Though Noon couldn't yet see enough to understand what was happening, she felt relieved. This was something, at least. She reached the bottom, a floor of stone or concrete, and paused until she was able to make herself speak. What did you find? He turned, though his face remained shadowed, impossible to read. His hands held an offering, an open book, as if he wanted her to look within. Rather than the book, she noticed his hands. They were nothing she recognized, skin dry and rough, unlike Ian's. This man was nobody she'd ever known. With this realization, Noon admitted that she'd always perceived him as a stranger and only pretended to imagine familiarity. Old stories, his rough voice, a hacksaw and metal, all about every life that ever brushed against yours or mine. Noon bit her lip hard, hoping pain might shock her back to clarity. Her eyes kept closing as if she were terribly tired, yet her mind was brilliantly awake. She wanted to run away, but forced herself to remain and to watch. You tell me the stories. Blood flowed, salt and iron slick on her tongue. Without hesitation, he spoke as if reading, though he still held out the book as if for her to read. A weak and insecure husband, 
whose ego manifests in cruelty. The man gestured with the book, beckoning her nearer, his heart all coldness and spite, disguised by soft hands, gentle manners, and superficial caretaking. Motionless before her eyes, words steady enough to read, yet she refused. The candle yielded enough light now that her eyes had adjusted. She knew she could easily accept what he offered. In fact, to avoid seeing the plain words required an effort of will. He shrugged, seeming tired of waiting, and flipped pages. Here. A story of Noon's avoided child. Never solid enough to be person. Only a ghost of the flesh or might have been shrugged loose before she ever grew in. Noon gasped, wanted to shrink and hide, but remembered what she'd promised. She remained. This unspoken name could have become a woman, he continued. Not here, but only in another life. One you never let yourself make real or even try. The candle hissed, sputtered, light fled, replaced by eye-burning smoke. His voice continued, disconnected from any shape. Without his familiar profile, which had suggested identity, the voice now seemed nothing at all like Ian's. Chapters of faithlessness, and all the many lies that flowed downstream. The neighbor Ian fucked while Noon was pregnant. The woman he swore he'd finished with said the woman had moved to Seattle. Noon believed, but look in these pages. Or later, the time Ian came home to tell Noon about the photocopier saleswoman he planned to run off with, only to return in the morning and insist Noon had only misunderstood that Ian had never planned to leave. He paused, cleared his throat. <clears throat> See how many more pages. Noon couldn't see anything at all. Couldn't he tell? All she could do was listen, choose to believe or not believe or possibly forget. None of these stories were familiar. Only some details were new, but to hear certain aspects spoken aloud was shocking. She felt the man's angled scrutiny, a trait she recognized, like his smell. This sense blended the long-term familiarity of Ian's characteristics with a more remote introduction, a smell redolent of intimacy, the recollection of which brought her to heightened sensitivity, that mingling of flesh, one with another, seizing pleasure, both surface and internal. Something she hadn't guessed before, she now realized might be possible. Joda? Are you Joda? She assumed that to ask would be enough, that he would reveal himself one way or another, but he said nothing. Her certainty faltered. What is this place? Noon's voice cracked to reveal a remnant of fear still active. Can you explain? Eyes adjusted, fed by feeble strands of sourceless light, something new. His scent faded. Certain she was alone again. Noon left that place beside the standing desk flanked by tall library shelves near the base of the stairs. She ventured away into the dark, arms outstretched, hoping for what she was unable to see. The time for exploration had come. Openness became aisles and hallways, which diverged at angles which could be measured. Velvet drop cloths lifted to reveal broken mirrors, the atmosphere vibrated with the smell of ferment, centuries old. A cobwebbed ring of ancient keys hung on a spike crusted with blood. Lanterns burdened by the dust and grease of age. Beyond such familiar artifacts, she found mechanisms barely recognized, connected to corners, bolted to the ground underfoot and extending to the ceiling, attached by hinged brackets, here also were tools of measurement, made for obscure increments. 
Copper surveyor sites, tripods of stained oak and white chalked plumb lines, alembics resembling glass bird heads on patinaed copper stands, some seething with the remnants of subtle pale flames made by absent alchemists, whose own eyes burned their own shelves of books in pursuit of the timeless chemistry of power, of life without end, of and insight without end. Can I stay here? Noon asked. Aware no answer would come, nobody was near. Overhead, unseen timbers creaked, gears ticked, and delicately arranged machine components made subtle adjustments to the rust-seized geometries underpinning the house. So much more remained buried, and would always remain hidden from sight. No matter how long she searched. Twenty four. Ascent. Return to the surface with knowledge. The strongest impulse Noon had ever felt was this need to explore. She was driven by the hope of discovering some transformative impetus, though she was also aware there could be no hope of gaining solace without an equal measure of anguish. To find meaningful connection would require first a penance of solitude. Even the best outcome would mean to wade through a river of pain, hoping to emerge transformed. What if this suffering were beyond her capacity to process and absorb? The prospect of successful emergence seemed unlikely, too distant. Noon turned back, retraced her steps, delved down paths that seemed vaguely familiar. After a long, solitary walk through quiet darkness, she rediscovered the flickering candle. That small fire was burning again, or had never really died. The flame was low, but offered light sufficient to convince Noon that she stood again in the same place as before, near library shelves of books and the high counter at which the man had stood flipping pages. He'd revealed part of her story, and whether that helped, whatever book he'd discovered must now be replaced, too similar to all the rest for Noon to discern which one it had been. For the first time, she saw the existence of far more books than fit on the shelves. Tall stacks teetered on the ground, and on the surface of a broad work table behind, Noon recognized this scene. What she really wanted was time of her own. You can't make me leave! Noon shouted, for whoever might hear. Ian, Joda... She didn't care. Anyone. No response came. She searched memory, retraced her life's progression in reverse, past milestones like the loss of ideals, the death of love and breakdown of marriage, and that invisible tipping point beyond which more life lay behind than ahead. All such markers were in the rear view, if they had ever truly existed as discrete, identifiable moments. Such events in her life had been so poorly marked, she'd never recognized them in passing, and now the woman she'd become was too far removed from the concept she imagined herself to be. Noon Radox was a stranger, a realization which set her adrift, not only detached from any fixed base, but also free from restraint or responsibility. To acknowledge this gap within her was actualization, not betrayal of self. The important thing now was to reconnect, to merge the person she saw in the mirror with the body she carried around, and her internal concept of what she was meant to become. Future must connect to past, or future died 
in obsolescence. Noon scanned the shelves and stacks. It was all too much, the stories too painful to retain in mind, too numerous to stow, the dismal betrayals too bitter to swallow and digest. All that was left was to walk away. She turned, faced the stairs, and started up. What she should hope to find above was uncertain, though she knew there would be no trace of Ian's presence. No silver Maybach sedan parked outside, no other visitor's car. To remain in solitude was the best she could hope for. What alternatives existed? She could return to Portland, ignore Ian's expectations, disregard his demands, fully aware of the limit to how long this, could, this would be tolerated. She could file for divorce, move to their Mount Hood condo, and start her own decorating business. Winters on the mountain would be snowbound, and what clientele could she possibly hope to gain in such a small town? Once, she and Ian had hoped to retire there, but when had they last even visited? Prospects for business would be better in Portland, but how would that work? Any hope of taking advantage of existing contacts would mean remaining in proximity to Ian through their common friends. Another dead end. Her aspirations still twitched as if living, yet she could envision no path to all she required. Decades of secure marriage, which Noon had always tried to believe offered stability and comfort, really only held her back, stifled her spirit, and sanded off the rough edges of character which might have allowed her to become something. Summarized this way, these limits clarified the reasons Noon had remained so long with Ian, despite feeling constantly starved, aching every moment with disappointment and sadness and the pang of undefinable loss. Ian was welcome to what remained of their Portland life. What had she left of any value? Nothing. All she needed was here, nearing the top of the stairs. Noon envisioned the broader world, far from here, eradicated in a clamor of noise and static, clouds blotted sun, except here. Only this house would survive. She reached the hallway, where the desk lamp remained lit, dimmed almost to nothing, as if its fuel had burned away like the candle in the basement. The floor creaked beneath her feet. She flicked off the light, no longer worried what might reside alongside her in the dark. The only remaining fear was that she might see clearly now, without the filter of denial, the disintegration that had always resided beneath the skin of everything, including herself. If she were to close her eyes, her fingers would feel the true, degraded roughness and decay, the age beneath the appealing facade of deception. Every person and thing looked best from one angle, or in a specific light, as compared to the many other, truer possibilities. Noon hoped never again to stumble into that point of view, from which all appearances cracked and perfection dissolved. So many pleasures dwelled here, waiting to be discovered, diverse luxuries, abundant beauties and delights, which increased in count and variety faster than she could consciously invent newer objects to desire, this was enough to offset her fear of what whispers might come in the night. Those voices had always derived from within herself, not only here, but always. Shades flitting in the dark were welcome to sing her to sleep with their hissing, static breath. Each morning, she would find a world made bright again, redesigned and expansive. In this dark hallway, Noon could not see the ground beneath her feet, but knew she must have trekked in a black dust from the basement. 
the dead powder of ancient wood, fine metal grindings from the disintegrating undercarriage, and the grease of subtle mechanisms, all slowly rattling toward decrepitude. This place would outlive her. That was enough. When she woke in the morning, she would wipe away these last dirty traces. After that, she would have no need for the basement, or anything outside this part of the house which was under her control. Noon pulled the door shut and locked it. The key vanished from her hand as if it had never existed. She walked toward the kitchen and did not need to look back. Already certain, the door, too, had disappeared. 